they are nonpartisan experts. Michael Kroll with the Institute of uh, Government at Chapel Hill is probably, now he's probably going to say, nah, 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 but he's probably the number one most knowledgeable person in North Carolina on ward representation and city government uh, elections. Ellis Hankins is the president, the executive of the uh, uh, North Carolina League of Municipalities. Again, both of these gentlemen are nonpartisan. I want to emphasize that. They're from out of town, which makes them experts. <laughs> Ellis has heard that before, yeah. Uh, but they truly are experts, and we're very proud and pleased to have them here at no cost to the city of Hickory. Like many other people in Hickory and throughout North Carolina, they're willing to commit their time and efforts at no cost to us so we can have an informed electorate. Ellis is going to start off asking Michael some questions. I can assure you that no one in the city of Hickory knows what those questions will be until we hear it from him. And then everyone here will have a chance to ask questions. We ask that we show these gentlemen the way we do things in Hickory. We do them as a group, even with varying opinions. We got people voting no and people voting yes, sitting side by side here. And on the 19th, we're going to be doing the same thing, however this turns out. And I am very pleased to say uh, the turnout's excellent. We're going to have a wonderful program here. And I'm going to turn it over to Ellis Hankins. We don't want to ha have any cheering except for Ellis and Michael at the beginning and the end. Let's hear it for Ellis right now. Thank you. Mayor Wright, thank you. Uh, it is a pleasure for us to be here. I'm Ellis Hankins. Um, I came here uh, to Hickory often as a child. I had relatives here, so it's good to be back. I live in Raleigh. Uh, Michael lives in Chapel Hill. Uh, let me tell you a little more before we get started about the North Carolina League of Municipalities that I work for um, and about the UNC School of Government where Michael is a member of the faculty. The League of Municipalities uh, is the association of all the cities and towns in North Carolina, of all sizes, um, all across the state. Um, I'm the executive director. It is uh, my privilege to work for municipal elected officials all across the state. And uh, the purpose of the League is just frankly to assist those folks whom you elect to do uh, their job of serving you better. We often work with the UNC School of Government on training programs and other things for local elected officials. The School of Government, obviously a part of the university at UNC Chapel Hill, um, carries out excellent training programs for government officials in the state, um, state and local level, does a lot of publications. Michael is a lawyer by training. I'm a recovering lawyer. He's a, he's a real one. Uh, Michael has been out in and out of private law practice and uh, onto and off the faculty at the UNC School of Government for a long time. Michael is an acknowledged election law expert, um, has been involved for many years in various cases in the state and federal courts and working with the U.S. Uh, Department of Justice the Civil Rights Division in Washington and with the State Board of Elections and um, other folks and other bodies on um, election matters. So Michael knows what he talks about and my job is to be the straight man. And We were pleased to be inv invited uh, by the city of Hickory. The mayor called and he said we just simply want you all to come and do the best that you can to answer questions people have to provide accurate straightforward information. Um, and we're going to try and do just that to answer the questions. And eventually we found our way here. <laughs> Well, no more about the naming of the streets in this city. One, one of the distinctive things for a long time about this city. I love Hickory Street numbering system. I have for years. I'm fascinated by it. It's wonderful. We um, stopped by Statesville on the way. The Statesville city manager is uh, retiring, and there was a little reception for him, so we accomplished that too, and we're here. Happy to be here. We are going to... Uh, 
engage in this little question and answer exercise here for a while to try to get some information out, we hope relevant, useful information uh, for, to you all for a while. But what we really want to do is the reason that that microphone, and there may be another one in the room, um, it, that microphone is here. We want to do our very best to answer questions that you all have. So please don't be shy and please be thinking about that. I hope we'll answer some of those uh, in this little dialogue that we are about to have. But uh, if not, or we don't answer to your satisfaction, then please plan to go ask a question. So Michael, let me start. Uh, what methods of election are available for local governments in North Carolina? There are several different ways that state law allows city councils to be elected. Uh, you can have at-large elections. Everybody's elected from the city at large. You can elect all your council members from districts. You can have a combination of districts and at-large elections. And you can use something like Hickory does where the districts are residency districts. At least for part of the election, uh, part of the election is held within the district. I know you call them wards. I'm going to use district. Uh, part of the election is held in the district and then part is held uh, citywide. And you can mix those things together. Uh, I know these things are not on the ballot. You have a choice of having partisan elections or nonpartisan elections. Uh, you can have plurality elections, the top vote getter wins, or you can have majority elections and have runoffs. Uh, state law sets the rules about what kind of elections you can have. And the folks who brought this referendum went to that list in the state statutes and chose one particular option. There are some other options that may be available through local acts of the legislature or court orders or some other varieties, but those are the main ones. So let me add to that. Um, the General Assembly of the state legislature in Raleigh um, incorporates cities and sometimes provides either in state law uh, or by local act, and I'll pick those up in a minute, um, what the type of election is and um, other matters. But by statute, the General Assembly also has provided authority either to city councils or to the folks who live in the city by petition uh, to propose changes in the way the mayor and council members are elected. And that's uh, how this um, proposal got before the voters. There was an initiative petition, which the statutes um, provide for, uh, and the city council followed through from there to do what the law requires to put that issue, the proposal, on the ballot um, soon. As North the Carolina said. generally doesn't, North Carolina generally doesn't have referendums, citizens, and citizen initiatives, uh, unlike, say, California. Uh, North Carolina generally doesn't have recall of public officials, uh, doesn't have ballot initiatives. This is this is one of the few exceptions to that. Michael, probably most folks here know the answer to this, but while we're at it, exactly what type of election, what form of election for council members does the city of Hickory have now? Uh, Hickory has primaries and elections. It is a nonpartisan primary. People don't run according to party affiliation. The primary is conducted only within the ward or the district. If there are no more than two candidates, then there's no primary because the top two are going on the ballot in the general election. In the primary, only the people who live in the ward, district, get to vote on that seat. The top two then go to the general election. And the winner of the, and then the general election, the voting is citywide instead of just within the ward. And the winner then is elected. And what is the proposed change? The proposed change is to have the entire election within the ward. Both the primary and the general election would be in the ward. So if there were no more than two people running for a seat from, say, Ward 3, uh, then there'd just be an election. And the 
only people in Ward 3 would vote, and the winner would be elected. Uh, if more than two people sign up to run, then there would be a primary held only within the ward to reduce the number to two. Still all on a nonpartisan basis. So what methods do other cities use? Overwhelmingly, the choice in North Carolina is at-large elections. Everybody in the city votes on all the seats. North Carolina has 522 municipalities. Mm, 540 correct? some. Well, 540. Uh, uh, North Carolina has 540 municipalities. A few too many, but I didn't say that. Uh, and I think it's 85% or so use at-large elections, elect all their members from the city at-large, everybody votes on all the seats, doesn't matter where in the city anybody lives. But keep in mind, North Carolina is a state largely of small towns. Uh, probably 440 of those 540 municipalities are under 5,000 people. Uh, well under. The la last number I saw was that there are only 34 cities in the state that have more than 25,000 people, including Hickory with 40,000. There are 12 cities in the range of 30,000 to 50,000 people. Hickory's right in the middle of that range. Of those 12, not surprisingly, eight elect all their council members at large. Everybody in the city votes on all the seats. Uh, two of those 12 cities, Goldsboro and Wilson, use district elections, use ward elections for electing all their council members. That's largely the result of voting rights issues and assuring minority representation in those two cities. That's how it came about, and we can talk about that more if you want. Uh, one of the 12 uses a combination, some seats at large and some from districts. And then there's Hickory with its own unique method of election. So Michael, how many cities uh, elect all council members from districts um, as is proposed um, with this initiative? The this last, ballot question. The last count I saw, it was 17 cities in the state. Uh, and I think all except for one of those are in the eastern part of the state. Uh, Winston-Salem is the farthest west. All the others are in the eastern part of the state. Uh, I've got a list somewhere I can name them if you want. Uh, again, the primary consideration in those cities using districts has been a voting rights concern. Uh, several of those cities, I mentioned Goldsboro, Wilson, were subject to voting rights lawsuits. Fayetteville is subject to a voting rights lawsuit to increase the chance for minorities to be elected, and the creation of districts was the way to do that. Have you noticed any trends in changing election methods? If there is a trend in North Carolina, and it's, it's hard to characterize that there's a particular method of election that's favored in one part of the state or the other or one size city or the other. But if there is any trend, the trend for the last 25 years has been more cities going to a district or ward method of election. You need to understand the basis for that. It's almost all the result of changes to the Federal Voting Rights Act from the mid-1980s. The same thing has happened with county commissioners and school boards. Uh, I'll give you a classic example of what's happened. I'm going to use a county as an example. Uh, Granville County in the 1980s, Granville is north of Raleigh. It's on the uh, border with Virginia. Granville County in the 1980s uh, had five county commissioners. They were elected from the county at large. Granville had 
40% African American population. No African American had been elected to the Board of County Commissioners in the history of Granville County. And the reason that was true was because of racially polarized voting. One of the most predictable things about voting, unfortunately, is that people tend to vote along racial lines. It's changing some in recent years, but in Granville County, what the study showed was that white voters tended to vote for white candidates, black voters tended to vote for black candidates. So you can see that if you elected all your county commissioners countywide, African Americans with 40% of the population were not likely and had not been successful in electing anybody. Because of changes made in the Federal Voting Rights Act in the mid-1980s, Granville County was one of the places, along with another number of other places in North Carolina, that were sued or were threatened with lawsuits challenging the method of election as having a discriminatory effect keeping minorities from being elected. The change that Granville County made was to go to a seven-member board of commissioners, all elected from districts, and it was possible to draw three of those seven districts that had African-American majorities. That's the same sort of thing that occurred with a number of other boards of county commissioners, a number of city councils, and a number of school boards around the state over the last 25 years. So when I say that the trend in city councils is toward more city councils being elected from wards, from districts, that's the reason. It's because of voting rights issues, and most of that has occurred in the eastern part of the state where the African American population is higher than it is in other parts of the state. And Michael, are most of those counties and the cities in them in the eastern part of the state subject to something called Section 5 of the uh, Federal Voting Rights Act? Yeah, I'm, I doubt we'll that... We'll get off real deep into this. Yeah, I doubt that you... I doubt that the group here really wants to get into a detailed discussion of the differences between Section 2 and Section 5 of the Federal Voting Rights Act. But... Section 2 is the part that was out, it's applicable everywhere in the country. It's the section to which changes were made in the 1980s and made these lawsuits more feasible. Section 5 is a part of the Voting Rights Act that applies only to certain parts of the country and says that before those areas can make any changes in their elections, they have to get approval of the U.S. Justice Department in Washington to make sure they aren't making it more difficult for minorities to vote and elect candidates. There are 40 counties in North Carolina that are subject to Section 5. Most of them are in the eastern part of the state. Catawba is not one of those counties because at the time Section 5 was ena enacted, there wasn't a sizable enough minority population in Catawba County to make it applicable. We are almost. And we're not going to talk about ecological regression analysis of voting patterns. No, I guarantee you we're not. as detailed as we're going to We get. are almost halfway through these prepared questions, just to let you know, and then be thinking, please, of questions uh, you all want to ask. So does the size of the city matter in choosing an election method? Uh, maybe you can answer that question. As far as I don't see any particular pattern in the way city councils are elected depending on the size of the city. As I already mentioned, most of North Carolina and most of the cities are small towns, under 5,000, under 10,000. Maybe a slightly higher percentage of them use at-large elections. You see a little more variety as cities get bigger, as you would expect. And what happens in some places, of course, is uh, it, you know, a city grows substantially over time, and they may find that the way they were electing folks doesn't suit the new, the new city as well. I don't see that size of the city makes a big difference either in the type of election that folks choose, but you told me to ask the question, so I did. The, what we really have is I think the General Assembly 
again, by statewide law and local acts for individual cities or counties, have allowed, have authorized citizens, voters who live in our cities and counties to determine the types of elections uh, and obviously who gets elected under whatever uh, type uh, form of election that there is for the governing body. Uh, and this is an important decision for you all. I should have said right up front, let me say it now, and we'll say it again before we're over. Neither Michael nor I have an opinion about what you all ought to do. Uh, we don't live here. We don't understand um, everything about the history, the culture, uh, the issues, uh, the needs of this city. So this is up to you all who do live here. Uh, and it's an important question. We just want to try to inform you and answer your questions. We know less about Hickory than everybody else in the room. That's true. So what objections, Michael? Including the street system. <laughs> While we're here. So what objections do you hear most often to district elections? There are advantages and disadvantages, yep. pros and cons to all of this. Keep in mind the context in which, which I've heard this. Uh, when I was in private practice, I was often representing local governments, boards of county commissioners, city councils, that were faced with a voting rights lawsuit or the threat of a lawsuit. And in most instances, the answer that I gave them was that if you litigate this, you're going to lose. Uh, and you need to change the way you're elected. And so they were considering alternatives. Uh, they were often considering going to districts from at-large elections. Sometimes they were considering other changes. And uh, so over time, I heard the kind of reaction that they would get from people with the different kinds of election changes they were considering. And when you talk about changing from uh, electing at large to electing from wards, uh, these are the things I heard. None of this is going to be new to anybody here. Uh, a lot of voters didn't like the idea of giving up votes. You know, in Granville County, the example I used, uh, before they made the change, every voter in the county got to vote for all five county commissioners. And then they were being told, well, you can only vote for one. We've got seven, but you can only vote for one. A lot of people didn't like that idea. And what they also didn't like was that if in their particular district the seat was uncontested, that there was you know, nobody running opposing the incumbent, then they had no seat to vote on in that election at all. They, had, they, had, they wouldn't have any seat. Also, what I heard from folks was uh, districts are good in providing minorities an opportunity to be elected that they previously didn't have. Maybe a racial minority, a political minority, a geographic minority. If you're a minority anywhere in the county or the city, and the city is sliced into districts, there's going to be at least some district where you have a better chance to get elected than you did before. But what it also means is if you are then a minority in the district, you don't have someone else that you can vote for in a, in a different part of the city. I heard a lot of concerns that, oh, if you start, people, start electing people from districts, uh, then all they're going to care about is the district. They aren't going to care about the county as a whole or the city as a whole. I don't know whether that's true or not. I think it depends a great deal on the local community. In my experience, what I saw from places after they changed to district elections was in some places that made a difference and some places it didn't. Uh, you know, and maybe you can talk about this, there aren't that many issues that a city council faces that are neighborhood issues. There are some things that are, uh, it makes a difference to one neighborhood over another, but 
There are not that many issues the city council faces their neighborhood well, issues. Well, I think okay. probably some of the council members here, um, current, former ones, it might say that there certainly are some issues, some landmines sometimes, folks, uh, things that really are important to particular neighborhoods or areas, zoning, land use issues sometimes, economic development issues, investment issues about where the council invests public funds to improve the public facilities and so forth. Those things certainly are, object, are important uh, to folks um, in different areas of the city and in every area of the city as far as I'm concerned. Uh, let, and let me mention a couple other things. Uh, one other concern I've heard people express and that sometimes has come true is if you elect only from from wards or districts, the number of people it takes to get elected is a lot less. Uh, in Granville County, uh, you know, once they went to districts, to seven districts instead of five elected at large, it takes about one seventh the number of votes as it used to to hold a county office. Uh, I looked back at some of the numbers for Hickory, and again, you folks know Hickory far better than I do. Uh, it appears, first of all, that you have fairly low turnout in all your city elections. Uh, it looked to me like a city of 40,000 people uh, for a good election, good city election, you may have 3,500 people or so vote. Uh, I did notice I could only find one recent primary that involved just a ward. Uh, and if I not read the numbers correctly, only 297 people voted in that particular election, for that primary for that ward. So one issue is how many votes does it take to get elected and is that person representative for a city-wide office? Let me see if I can put that another way. If in a ward system where uh, voters in that ward or district uh, only uh, vote for candidates in that ward, um, highly motivated voters, groups of them, uh, who may be concerned about one or several issues, um, uh, would have a better chance of banding together with a smaller number of votes and getting the candidate of their choice elected. Is that fair to say? Yes, and, and I think you can view that as a good thing or a bad thing, depending on, on your perspective. The other question I hear, heard people talk about with, with districts, and this has become a statewide issue, is confusion over districts. We didn't used to. The, you know, the landscape of North Carolina has changed dramatically in the last 20, 25 years. We didn't used to elect legislators, all our legislators from districts. You know, 25 years ago, Wake County elected all members of the House of Representatives, the North Carolina House of Representatives, all six members countywide. We didn't used to elect them from single member districts. Uh, right. That's right. Uh, now, Wake County is divided into what, eight or nine districts. There are now a lot more boards of county commissioners that are divided into districts for the reasons I explained. There are more school boards divided into districts. That's why when you go to, a, to vote uh, in one precinct, people may have several different styles of ballots they vote depending on which, which district they're in. Uh, we, we've got a little bit of district overload, I think and it makes it harder for people to, to recognize, remember what district they're in. It's not so much of a problem on a city level. Uh, on, a, on, a, on a county level, we've split a lot of precincts. Uh, we've split neighborhoods and drawing legislative districts. All that makes it more just, it's, people have to pay more attention to where they live. Right. Um. Michael, you've talked about some of this in your previous answers, but what are the main reasons cities typically change to district elections? Uh, it, I'm going to be repeating myself. It's minority representation more than anything else. And I, 
largely it's been driven in North Carolina by minority racial representation. Districts drawn so that African American voters have a better chance to elect candidates than they would if the election were citywide or countywide. Uh, but it can also be uh, political minorities or geographic minorities. Uh, if, you know, Wake County, uh, I'm not sure of the statistics now, but Wake County, where Raleigh is, uh, used to, when the legislative elections were all countywide, uh, I think there were six representatives elected. Democrats had a countywide majority, and typically they would elect all of those representatives countywide. Well, if you start chopping Wake County into districts, and some of those districts are going to be heavily Democratic, some are going to be heavily Republican, and uh, so uh, Republican Party was able to elect candidates using district elections that it wasn't able to do countywide. And that's going to be true of any political, major any political minority. You chop an area up and there's going to be some part of that area where the, where the political minority has a better chance than it had before. Same thing geographically. There may be geographic areas of the, of the city or the county uh, that uh, if you have at-large elections can't often get represented. Districts provide them an opportunity to be elected. So other than what you said, what are the likely effects of changing to district elections? Well, the principal effect is that some groups who were not able to be represented before are likely to get represented, likely to be Depending elected. on how the districts are drawn, for among, among other things. Depending on, how the, depending on how the districts are, long, are drawn. Let me make one aside. The first election, if you change the method of election, the first election under the new method will not necessarily be representative of how it's going to be in the future. Every time you change elections, you get more candidates for that first election than you ordinarily would. People who had thought of running before but didn't run with a new method of election, they don't know that they don't have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so they run. And because nobody's quite sure what the outcome is going to be. So that first election is usually unique. More candidates run, more people run than ordinarily would. It then settles after that people figure out what their chances really are or not, uh, and, and then you get a pattern after that. And every 10, you're not finished answering the question, I know, but every 10 years or so, the districts change because of the census, correct? That's correct. And, and Hickory already has to do that with the wards because they're used for the primaries. Uh, ward elections should, or district elections everywhere, should reduce the cost of campaigning and change the style of campaigning. It should, I don't know about Hickory because I don't know the markets. I don't know how people run for office in Hickory. I don't know whether people mostly buy newspaper ads, whether anybody buys radio or television. If anybody's buying radio or TV time, it's less useful to do that if you're running in just a ward. You're wasting a lot of money on a TV ad that's going to reach a lot of people who can't vote on you. So uh, generally, there should be more old-style, door-to-door campaigning, meet people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it can vary depending on the circumstances and how people are used to running in local elections, and that varies a great deal from place to place. Back for a minute to your comment previously that uh, it is not clear that uh, district elections result sometimes in some folks uh, getting elected and then caring only about their particular part of the city. I've seen it both ways, frankly, across the state. 
I think it matters more who gets elected than it does how. Um, good people who get elected at large or in a district ward system. Um, Community-minded people are going to care about the, the uh, safety and welfare of folks across the city and are going to act accordingly as a, an elected public official. Some folks, frankly, who get elected in an at-large system, I've seen many times, they get elected um, at large, but then they only care, turns out, about a particular area of the city that they live in where their friends live. So I, I don't know. I, I think that cuts both ways. It depends more, I think, on, on who gets elected. Well, let, let me add something, and I'm going to try to be careful in the way I say it because I don't want you to think I'm saying something I'm not. One thing that ward or district elections do is it gives people, some people who have not previously had an opportunity to be elected citywide to be elected. As I said, a political minority, racial minority, doesn't necessarily a guarantee that they're going to be elected, but depending on how the wards are drawn, it can enhance their chances. What that also means is you may have a more divisive council or board because, again, trying to be careful about what I say. I don't want you to think I'm saying something else. Because you have different groups being elected, they may have reasons to disagree with each other more than people who are elected by sort of a consensus kind of citywide vote. They are being elected, they can be elected from a district because they are representing more the views of that district, which may be different from the views of the city as a whole. And so there may be, there may be more disagreement. It may be harder to reach a consensus. There may be, Just, put another way, there may be some pent-up demand by some folks well, who see themselves as representing groups that have, they think have not been adequately represented in the past. And, and the best example of this is the North Carolina General Assembly. We, and I, I'm not saying this in derogatory way. We now elect all members of our legislature from single member districts. All 120 members of the House of Representatives are elected from single member districts. What that means is you have people with more I don't want to use the word extreme, but people with views more strongly one direction or another than they had before. And in a democracy, that may be a good thing. You know, people who, uh, you know, bleeding heart liberals from where I live, Tea Party conservatives from the next county over, uh, they are now both represented, and they have some trouble sometimes agreeing on issues. They don't agree on much of anything. Um, Spit, let me but, see if I can bail you out of this, dig you out of this hole a little bit, Michael. I, Speaker of the House said to me last year that among his, obviously, Republican caucus in the House, there was a lot of pent-up demand. They felt like they'd been not been represented adequately um, um, in the past, and so they we're intent on accomplishing some things, um, some of which some of the folks I work for didn't like much, pent up demand. But, yeah. um, so what is the, this is a trick question, what is the ideal method of election? You answered that when we started. Uh, what did I say? Even if I knew the answer, I wouldn't tell you, but the truth is I don't know the answer. Uh, my experience is uh, that you can have two municipalities who are they're about the same size, seem to have about the same demographics, and use two entirely different methods of election, and they work for both. It all depends on the history, the tradition of politics in the community. Uh, there's no one size fits all. Frankly, what I've seen in my years, and I've worked 
28 years, two periods of time for the League of Municipalities and have paid some attention to this across the state all those years. What I've seen, the best way I can generalize it is in cities, towns, whatever size, where more people are actively involved and engaged and care about the future of the community, things work better, no matter what the form of election. That's what I've observed. Uh, and this, one of your observations, Michael, about the, the, the risk or the danger of the council and using one form of election or another being more divisive or divided, I've seen that in every form or type of election that you can think about. And eventually, unfortunately, it happens to most cities. You go through a period where council members, there may be two factions, they just don't agree on much, and it takes a while to overcome that. Sometimes it just takes another election or two, whatever the type of election is. I can tell you there are some communities in North Carolina that people just cannot get along. I don't. I don't care what the method of election is. When I was in private practice, I used to keep a list. I would not go back to this county. <laughs> you know, I had, I had sessions with boards that would meet in session and decide to settle a lawsuit unanimously, and then as soon as it was over, they'd go out and sue each other. And that was just the way they did things in that particular community. Uh, there are different. I live in Chapel Hill. I am fascinated by the differences between Wake County, Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. Three communities that are right near each other, and it's like night and day. There is a old Southern genteel way of politics in Raleigh that is just as strange to Durham as you can imagine. And it doesn't matter what method of election they use. It's, it's part of what's it's in culture. the water there. It's All part right. of the culture. All right. There are three more of these questions. And then we're going to open that mic. Now, Michael you, thinks you there are only two. One. He thinks there are only two, but there's three. Because <laughs> um, I am going to add one. What should voters be thinking about? What do you think voters should be thinking about in deciding how to vote in this referendum? We're not going to suggest how anybody vote because reasonable people certainly can have different opinions about this question. Well, the, the one thing I've always said to folks when they're considering a change is think about why it is you want to make the change. In my experience, uh, whenever there's a change in election being considered, it's because of some issue that has arisen. In most instances, as I mentioned, in recent years, it's been voting rights issues. And what they were trying to accomplish was to increase the opportunity for African-American representation. Uh, whatever your purposes are, whatever your goals are, uh, think about whether the method of, whether the change you're considering will in fact accomplish that goal. Uh, I've given one example, and I've I've repeated it probably too much. If the goal is minority representation, then uh, districts is one way to improve the chances for doing that. If it's geographic representation, how well it can be accomplished depends on the size and nature of the city. And also, one person, one vote. Uh, remember that the districts are going to have to be equal in population given that constraint, can you in fact create wards that serve the purpose that you want, that, that assure the representation of that political or geographic minority that you're interested in? Equal in population adjusted every 10 years after the census. Um, we have, we've read, we've done a lot of reading before we came here. One of the things we've read is a suggestion by some folks that the city council could have or still can just cancel this referendum and adopt this change by ordinance. Could they? I think they should do that and we should all just go home. <laughs> no. Don't. Here's the real answer to the question. Don't take that seriously. <laughs> don't take that seriously. As you know, the, the scheme of things in North Carolina is that a city council does have the authority on its own 
to change the way it's elected. They can do it by adopting an ordinance. Uh, when they pass a resolution saying they're going to do that, if people don't like it, they can petition to have a referendum on it. And of course, if the city council isn't interested at all in making the change, people can initiate the process by petition of their own, as has been done here. Uh, it seems to me, and I've not seen a case about this, I haven't seen this tested, it seems to me that given the wording of the statute, which says that once the petition has been submitted to the council, they shall call a referendum, I think the city council has to go ahead with the referendum. That's, that's my at, at opinion, too. I don't statute think, says shall. I that's think there's, opinion. and if you think about it, there's maybe a little opportunity for mischief if they didn't do that, they might undermine it uh, if they didn't. So I, I th think they probably have to go ahead with the referendum now. Okay. Do you have any other questions in mind before we open the floor at that microphone? No. I don't. In your role, in your role as director, executive director of the League of Mun Municipalities, you deal with a lot of city council members from around the state. You've probably interacted with more than anybody, uh, anybody I can imagine. Fun on most days. <laughs> Do you see any difference between the kinds of council members who are elected from districts, from cities with districts, and those who come from uh, cities without large elections, either in you know, their characteristics, their behavior, their, their view about the city? Yes and no. Um, good community spirited folks get elected all across the state in cities of different sizes with all kinds of different forms of elections. Um, clearly, as you said, um, uh, particularly in the eastern part of the state, where because the law, the federal law, required it, um, there's been more of a move toward district elections, um, more African American mayors and council, member, council members get elected uh, in those cities and towns certainly than used to be the case. But other than that difference, uh, no, I don't see a great difference in the form of election and the results and uh, good governance that, um, that occurs. Now. I wonder if they have any questions. I bet they do. That microphone is open. Please feel free to ask any question that you want, but please keep them to questions, not lengthy statements. We'll allow some statements. Folks do that sometimes, I know, but questions which we'll do our best to answer. There, I understand that there is going to be a debate soon and it's scheduled it's September 4th. September 4th, I'll call that. Okay, so this is not a debate. Uh, that event later will be for that purpose, this was billed as, um, um, as a community information forum. Um, so we want to try to answer your questions. And so please step to that microphone. I think that's the only microphone in the room. We'll debate other issues with you, you know, right. if you want. We'll debate each other, maybe. If we, you want to talk about that. gay marriage, we'll, we'll. No, we won't. Yes, sir. Is there currently a requirement that the representative from each ward actually live in that particular ward? That is a far more complicated question than you know, the that you realize. But lawyers can never, usually never answer a question just yes or no. <laughs> the answer is generally yes, but Part of the complication is the combination of wards and primaries in the ward and general election at large. 
there's a state constitutional requirement about being qualified to vote in the district from which you're elected. How do you interpret that when part of the election's in the ward and part citywide? But let's just say, yes, they have to live in the ward. Next question, sir. In, the, in fact, yes. there's a provision in the Chapter 160A, the municipal statutes, that says that once they move from the district, they are ipso facto disqualified. And what does that mean? Ipso facto. I don't speak Latin. Oh. <laughs> All right. Yes, sir. In the uh, cities that made the change to uh, pure ward uh, elections, did you see any sustainable uh, improvement in voter turnout? It is a darn good question. Um, and I haven't made a detailed study of it. My, uh, my impression is no, no consistent pattern. It, it depends on what the local issues are. If you, you can have a decrease in voter turnout if you have, say, five wards and only two of them have contested elections. You may have a decrease in the people who turn out to vote at all in that election because although they can still vote for mayor, say, if they don't have a contested election in their own ward, they may not turn out at all. On the other hand, uh, and that's all we're up here to say is on the one hand this, on the other hand that. On the other hand, uh, sometimes ward elections can generate an interest for that particular seat, but there'll be more turnout, at least in that part of the city, for that election, but not necessarily the other parts of the city. But on the other hand. But on the other hand, was that sufficiently confusing? Since I'm a lawyer too. Um, you do see every now and then, and this is not just in ward elections, but particularly in ward elections, where sometimes some election years in municipalities, in a municipality, you have an unusually low voter turnout. Uh, you see some unexpected results, uh, particularly with incumbents losing the election. Um, uh, that's certainly happened in Winston-Salem, for example, about three years ago. Um, and it doesn't take many votes sometimes, and when you have a low turnout, uh, strange things can happen, or unexpected things. Look, go look at the voter turnout for Hickory City elections. How many people had to sign the petition? Was it something over 2,000? At least 10 percent of the registered voters. If 2,600 people in Hickory got together on anything, they could control the whole city. One, one of the, and we'll take the next question in a minute, one of the uh, comments that I made earlier about, uh, in my experience, um, the municipal government working better, perceived as being more responsive, people generally happier, uh, was when more people were actively involved um, and demonstrated that they cared about the long-term um, future of the community. Uh, part of what I meant was voter turnout, higher voter turnout, participation in citizen boards and commissions, and just generally paying attention to local issues and talking in a respectful, productive way with the elected folks instead of just saying, oh, all those people we elect are crooks. I always wondered, well, do we only elect people who are in that category, or do they all become that way right after we elect them? I've never known which. But, sir, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. I'm going to uh, preface my question with a comment about the statistics first. For weeks I've been hearing the 85% of some number that's being, being used. And so I decided to do some research on my own and I've polled or done a survey of the, of the 30 most populous municipalities in the state of which Hickory, according to the 2010 census is 21st. 
and a little over 40,000 population. Right. Of those 30, 40, just under 50% of those either use at-large voting or a combination of at-large and ward, where the ward is ward-only voting as opposed to citywide for the wards. So my question is, should the people of Hickory, in, in trying to decide which is the best way to go, and I'll save my comments for the debate, which I think you said it was September 4th, should the citizens of Hickory really be focusing on the structure and the composition of the city councils of the larger municipalities around the state versus a, a sample size of 540, which by your own statement really encompasses very small communities of 5,000 or less? Yeah, I, I tried to give you information uh, about the state as a whole and also about different categories of cities. And in the, as I mentioned, in the category of 30,000 to 50,000, uh, I think I said there were 12 cities in that category. Eight of those are at large. Uh, and there are two, Goldsboro and Wilson, that use districts only of those 12. Uh, but I think, as I said earlier, the larger you get, the more variety you see in the kind of election, kinds of elections that cities use. And uh, I was trying to look for cities that not only were closer to the size of Hickory, but in, in this part of the state, and just couldn't find much to compare Hickory with. Michael, I, and, and by the way, the, the, I'm going to make a general comment and then direct you to a specific piece of information. Um, I think that information about what other cities do, to some extent, is um, helpful and relevant. Now, how helpful, how relevant, and whether folks want to base their decision on that as a factor or not as an individual thing. Um, the, I think I remember that the city probably in the, the one of the larger cities that comes the closest to the form of election that Hickory has now is probably Gastonia with a significantly higher population, 70 some thousand if I remember. Okay. The best source for this sort of comparative information about uh, how uh, elections are conducted uh, in various cities is on the School of Government website. Uh, you want to tell them about that? Like everything on our website, it's difficult to find. <laughs> it was designed if, by lawyers. But if you go to the School of Government website, you know, just Google UNC School of Government, go to publications, and there's a search feature there, which generally doesn't work very well. But if you're careful to put in the words form of government, you'll get linked to an online publication showing how all municipalities in North Carolina elect their councils. Called something like Forms of Government in North Carolina Municipalities. Yeah. Next if question. You, if you search and you don't find it right away, keep trying. Or call one of us. Be happy to direct you to it. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, there's been some little bit of innuendo in some of the letters to the editor about the concern about there may be some crooks, so to speak. Um, I was on the city council years ago in another city, a little bit smaller. South of here? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How's that? Okay. I was on the city council years ago in a city just smaller than Hickory, and we had a city council um, ward system, and we had three councilmen. And I don't remember the years that I was on that, that there was any backroom uh, conniving to get, you know, you vote for this and I'll vote for that. I think with a vigilant newspaper and uh, good council people and caring people here, that that won't happen. What's your perspective on that? I stated my opinion early. Let me say it again. I think it has it matters more who is elected than how they are elected. And I think you know, on the thankfully fairly rare occasions in our North Carolina cities and towns across the state where we see people, elected officials doing things that are just flatly wrong and every now and then illegal, 
Um, I can't point to any particular system or form of election that resulted in that. Uh, my conclusion is the wrong people got elected. Yeah, when I was in private practice, I used to represent some of those crooks. And, and so did I. And they came from, yeah, they could come from any system. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, let me preface my statement by, I just want to thank you both. I want to thank Mr. Barry and the city for having you here because this has been very good information for everybody, I think. And so thank you for coming and thank you, Mr. Barry, for doing uh, what you did to get this doing. Um, is there any correlation at all across the state in particular types of electoral processes here between uh, incumbency being maintained or not? Someone could do a study of this. I haven't seen it. My impression is that it's somewhat easier for people to get entrenched in district seats than in at large mm -hmm. seats. Now, it varies a great deal from place to place. But, uh, and I think you see this, again, I'm using the legislature as an example. I think, and that may not be that good an example because legislative seats are large enough that they can be designed to elect particular people. Uh, you know, when the Republicans are in charge of redistricting in North Carolina, they're going to draw this number of seats that are absolutely positively Democrat seats, and these number they're absolutely positively Republican, and the Democrats are going to do the same thing, and there are just a few seats that, that may be up for grabs between the two of them. So they're more designer-created seats at the legislative level, and you you see people who are able to hold on to their seats a little bit longer and easier. Um, but again, it varies a great deal according to the history and nature of the community as to, uh, you know, I don't know what the history is in Hickory now. Do you have just looking at the last few years, it doesn't look like there have been a lot of contested elections. Is that right? That's somewhat true, yes, sir. Uh, let me... It's, it's varied. I mean, somewhat true. Let me state an opinion. Um, some, of the, some of the best and some of the not best elected officials um, at the legislative level um, in cities, mayors, council members, and county commissioners for that matter. Uh, some of the best I've seen have been in office for a very long time. Some of the worst that I've seen have been in office for a very long time. Uh, I, again, I think it matters more who stays, who's allowed by the voters to stay in office than, you know, the incumbency and whether there are limits. I have a bias. I'm not a fan of term limits. I think we have term limits. Our Constitution is very clear. It says we shall have regular elections. And we all as voters get to decide how long people stay in office. And some people are very committed, care about the community, and they stay in office because the voters keep re-electing them when they offer themselves for continued service. Um, and they serve the community very well. What else? I'm, Sir, let me. I'm glad I have Ellis here to, to take care of my answers. Mick, may I ask you to do a favor? Gentleman on the first row who has difficulty getting to the microphone has a question, and I think that mic can be brought to him. Well, it's coming to you, sir. Thank you. It's, that, it's in your hand. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I have two questions if you don't mind. The first question is, since we currently use modified at large voting in the city of Hickory, is it true 
that incumbents can do block voting where when they are elected at city at large, two wards can come together and vote for that one individual which would just about guarantee them re-election. Whereas if it was ward elections, then that would not be possible. Is that true? To the extent I understand the question, I think the question is, if you were electing only from wards, you know, it, if you're being elected in an election that includes people outside the ward, can people outside the ward choose someone different than the people in the ward might choose? Sure. I mean, that's obvious on the face of it. Is that the question? That is the question. The, the chances of block voting in the modified and large voting system as we have it pretty much would guarantee someone from a ward that may not be chosen by their ward voters could, be, could still be elected by the at-large voting uh, system because of block voting that could occur is what I'm asking. And you're saying, yes, that is true, that more than likely if we get block voting where more than one ward votes for that individual, then their chances of winning is much greater than if the voters in their ward only voted for them. Again, if I understand, it seems obvious on the face of it that the people outside the ward can choose someone different than the people inside the ward might choose. Just as pretty much always happens in every election I vote in, other people choose somebody different than I vote for. <laughs> my, my second question is, um, and I forgot it. <laughs> well, why, let, me, let me make a well, comment while let, you're trying to remember the second question. I, okay. Another way of saying, I think, what Michael said in response is that under the current system, the candidates uh, in each of the districts who make it successfully through the primaries and become the nominee residing in that particular or any of the districts, the wards, uh, have to go seek votes all across the city and get enough of them to be elected. And if they are able to do that, they get elected. And if not, uh, the other candidate from that district or that ward does. That's the current system. And it's up to you folks to decide whether that's a good thing or not. There are advantages and disadvantages. My second question is, you gentlemen, keep up with the way that the city councils across the state of North Carolina vote on the issues that come before those city councils. Is it normal 99.5% of the time to have a unanimous vote on every item on the agenda by a city council? Let me take that. That varies. That, um that varies city to city. Um, I, I've seen, I see it all over the map. There are a good number of municipalities in this state. Uh, Marion, for example, one of our, one of our prettier towns up the hill from here. Um, but not as pretty as Hickory. <laughs> not as pretty, right. I said one. Of, uh, I have lots and lots of favorite cities and towns in this state. Um, Marion, for example, uh, has had a lot of stability uh, among members of the council. Uh, very little turnover. There's very good diversity on that council, too, and it's the council's very representative of the community across the city. Um, I bet you um, that votes on matters before the council in that city with that city council, and for years, has been at the percentage, the high percentage that you mentioned. Um, and you don't hear, you don't hear concerns expressed generally from the community about that. I know of other uh, communities, and I said this 
uh, that communities and councils, for that matter, go through rough spots. And sometimes you see a council that gets into a situation where there are factions and it becomes divisive. I guarantee you in those situations, whatever the form of election is, there are not unanimous votes uh, very often. Sometimes there are. Uh, and even in the General Assembly, with uh, members from two political parties and every now and then an independent or two, every now and then you actually see a, a unanimous vote. Not often. Um, <laughs> the, so it, it, it matters more, I think, of the, the culture in the community, the tradition in the community, and on the city council, mm -hmm. the number of unanimous votes that you see. And I don't think it has much to do, in my experience, with the type of election. I'll add briefly to that. Uh, my experience is the same. It is the culture of some places that boards operate by consensus. Other places, that is not true. The one difference I have seen is, not surprisingly, that as boards get larger, it is less likely that they're going to operate by consensus. That's right. Sooner, uh, and if it's large enough, you have a legislature, and there's much, much less consensus. What other questions, sir? Why would could a, you stand up, please? Why would a council, without doing a referendum or taking it to the people, switch from a pure ward system to a modified blended system? I believe that that is something more than a rhetorical question. And from what I recall, that may have something to do with the history of changing elections in Hickory, because uh, I, I believe I've heard that it was back around 1970 or so that that change was made. I have no idea why it was and done we, at we that time. We don't know the I'm, history. I'm way too young to know. Although we met a gentleman today whom I knew in Statesville, former mayor, whose name is John Marshall. Michael met him for the first time. I said, now your friends, Michael, you can tell them you've met John Marshall. And some of them will believe that you're old enough to have actually met the John Marshall. But yes, ma'am. Right. Uh, the vote no signs I've seen along the lawns in the area surrounding downtown Hickory are stamped with the name of the No Steps Backward Committee. How do we move forward as a city when the people in power are so comfortable saying no to change that they try to tell us that its improvement is stepping backward? What advice could you give us in order to move forward and progress as a city in modern times? I, I, Michael might have his own opinion. I don't know that the two of us can give you all much useful advice on that. Um, can I say again that the cities where things seem to work the best are the ones where more and more people are actively involved and voice their opinion and sometimes differing opinions, but do it doing. respectfully and productively uh, and find ways to be actively involved in the community. I don't think we have much of an answer for you on that question. I think we may have bored them to the point that there are no more questions. Hit. We're near the last opportunity. Are there, are there other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, there's more. Thank you so much. I, do you all recognize this book? I think this is y'all's notebook, School of Government. And I was trying to find some answers in here. I haven't found them yet. But I stumbled on something I thought was just fascinating. And maybe, maybe you wrote this. I don't know. But it's under citizen involvement. Um, it's under county and municipal government, North Carolina citizens involvement. Uh, low voting and common reasons for lack of engagement. I thought it was extremely insightful. I'm grateful for this. Um, why do citizens well, I not? I must have written it. I'm so, you must have written it. Yeah, I, maybe it, it'll probably come come there, to your mind. There is a large faculty. Right, go ahead. <laughs> it says um, this is from 2007, I think. But at any rate, it says why do citizens not participate? Low voter turnout can be explained by four main reasons: a sense of disconnect with government lack of time, lack of encouragement or support from government, and factors specific to the issue at hand. First, citizens may not feel as though they are associated with government. That, this, can run from the, this can range from alienation to distrust to apathy. In the worst case, government is seen as actively discouraging citizen involvement. And I would just like to say, as an attorney, as a mother, a wife of 30-some years who 
my mother lives with me. I don't know. I may be very odd bird, but my city council will not respond to me in city council meetings. So yes, I feel I'm being actively discouraged. What is um, far more in common, um, let's see, this apathy may be an important is, reason for low voter Is there a question Trump. in there somewhere? There is a question coming. Michael's worked with judges right. for a long time. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, lack of time may not be the true issue. Um, sometimes citizens can't reach polling places when they're open. Extended polling place hours, multiple locations, early voting experiments, and efforts to extend voting by mail and electronically have all tried to address accessibility problems with voting. Now those, those have been cut down, cut back a whole lot this past year. Um, do, does the public feel as though government officials are making a clear and conscious effort to encourage and support citizen participation? Uh, not, not in my experience. Uh, seriously, um, are, are you getting I to do. a question? I do. Here comes my question. Thank you. All right. Uh, the reality may be that local government officials tend to prepare for citizen involvement as if citizen involvement were a problem. And citizens aware, are aware of this image. Anecdotes suggest that if a citizen makes an appointment with the city can, manager, can we, can we it is now probably get to not the question, to. Please. Yeah, I'm, I'm, wrapping, no. I'm on my way to my question. I'm on my way. Soon. Are you in no. a hurry or do you need to go to no, the no, we, we said Would you like, the beginning would you like we to were, take a recess? Okay. Well, we just don't think we just don't That's think That's why if you need a recess, I don't mind. We just don't think it's fair to I'm not to other okay. Folks That's okay. That, let me I don't mind a recess. Let me suggest that you sure. that's the sort of information um, this perhaps is on one side. I it think is. it's brilliant. Perhaps on one side of the issue that would be good this for is someone. This is government. To, it's not it's not uh, biased. For someone to use in the debate about okay. this issue. Okay. Okay. Right. Question. All right, here please. comes the question. Okay. Um, but at any rate, it's just like, um, you know, I imagine you all love to read the city minutes just like I do, and I know you remember the minutes from the city meeting in Chattanooga where there was a man who said, make sure whatever you do with your project, get full citizen involvement. Do you all remember that? That was about, I don't know, October of last year from Chattanooga. So it's just like you all were saying, the best projects, the best communities are where there's full participation. So that's where we hope to step forward. And what do you think about that idea? I think that you all, all of you who are registered voters, are entitled to go vote and decide this question. Yeah. And I, and we need to remind everyone this is not a debate. Next question, sir. I have a simple question. Um, there's been some uh, statements saying that uh, our votes will be diluted by uh, doing ward voting. And um, I mean, this is maybe a little bit of a mathematical question, but roughly there's about 6,000 people in each ward. And so my vote, if I'm voting for a ward, I'm, my vote's worth one six thousand. Now, if I'm voting in the city, it's 40,000, so my vote is worth one forty thousand. Is that a way to look at that? And even if there's low turner vote out, uh, turn, low turner low voter turnout my vote is worth even more so i don't quite understand how that dilutes uh my vote by having a ward system again i think that's more of an argument than a question but just make this point if elections are in wards only then yes your vote has more weight for that seat than it does in a citywide election. On the other hand, as we're inclined to say, if you have a citywide election, you get to vote for more people than you do in a ward. So you figure out which matters the most to you and, and which you think is most important. Sir. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, comment made earlier about a disconnect between the voter and the elected. Uh, which is more likely, which dynamic is more likely, 
that the elected would be more responsive to the city at large, the voter at large, if we have at large voting, or if he's going to be more responsive to just the citizens of the ward that put um, him in place? If I could divine the uh, correct answer to that question, I would then recommend that type of election. And I cannot divine, I don't know. Um, I think experience runs all across the map, as I said. I think it matters more who gets elected than how they're elected. Yeah, see, if, if you were listening before, you knew we were going to say that. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to the debate on the 4th. I will be there. Oh, one other Glasses. question. Uh, if you would like some instruction on the streets of the city of Hickory. I think I can enlighten you on that. Very if you, good, if like very that. good. I actually, I actually one time had somebody give me a lecture on it. It was very interesting, interesting history. Mayor, we're very happy if there are one or two last burning questions. We have plenty of time. Ma'am. Can I ask a question? Okay. Um, I just wondered if you could give your opinion on the, with a city of this size, with the, as you said, there's a pretty low voter turnout. Um, for local city um, issues. So, and specifically, we have a low um, minority turnout. So I'm just wondering, in your opinion, would you say that a ward system would be more likely to increase the involvement of minorities and voter turnout? Do you have an opinion on that at all? Or? It depends on how the wards are drawn. Uh, and, and I don't, know the demographics of Hickory well enough. But I assume with a 14% African American population that you can draw at least one ward that is not majority black, but has a fairly substantial, uh, substantial minority, more than 14%. And typically what happens is when minority voters have a chance, see a better chance to elect someone, uh, they're more likely to turn out. On the issue of voter turnout in municipal elections, that is a problem from my perspective, low, relatively low voter turnout in many of our cities and towns across the state with all different forms, types of elections. In the late 1960s, the General Assembly started working on revising the municipal election statutes, and they enacted those changes in 1971. Um, I wasn't there then, but uh, I was born, but not working. Um, our, the municipal officials in office at that time decided, they asked members of the General Assembly to move municipal elections to odd-numbered years. Their reasoning for that was they preferred that municipal elections, that the issues in the elections not be overshadowed by national and state partisan politics. Uh, so there was kind of a trade-off. They, they knew that probably there would be a lower voter turnout, mm -hmm. but they thought it was important that uh, local issues be thoroughly discussed in the community and that the elections be based on those issues. Voter turnout, I think, Michael, has declined in municipal elections over the years. The, the High Point City Council did something interesting several years ago. There actually now are two of our municipalities that have elections in even-numbered years. Anybody know who those two are? You know who those two are? I do, but I don't want to spoil it. That's All right. It's, 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 high, darn. it's High Point and Randleman close by, or is it uh, it's the, the other municipality just south of High Point, not Randleman? Um, Archdale. It's Ar High Point and Archdale. Thank you. Um, those city councils ask the General Assembly by local act to move their elections to even number of years because they were concerned about voter turnout. And sure enough, voter turnout went up in the elections, and now the city councils, and at least High Point, I know, are disappointed because now they feel like local issues get ignored. And now they wish they hadn't made that change. Uh, one other Voter turnout is, is much higher during presidential elections sure. than any other. Sure. This is sort of a part two to the question, and I think it may be the question that I could hear in Rebecca's conversation. 
um, or it's the question that came up for me. It's the question I want to hear your opinion on it is, um, let's say that there is a city like ours with the population that we have, the minority population as well that we have, the voter turnout that we have, and let's say that there was a large amount of people who don't vote because they feel disempowered around representation, then would you suggest that a ward system could potentially empower them and get them more involved? The effect a ward system can have is for any minority, again, racial minority, political minority, geographic minority, any minority that has previously felt like it just didn't have a shot yeah. citywide. Undoubtedly, in one or more districts, they will have a better chance than sure. they had citywide. So to the extent that the likelihood of success motivates people yeah. to run, to go out, then it could have that effect. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Thank you for your attention. We have enjoyed it. I'd like to just quickly say one thing. First of all, we appreciate your uh, the degree to which you have uh, been very polite to these gentlemen. We hope you understand the reasons for establishing some basic rules of decorum. It's not because we want to set rules. It's just because we want to keep things uh, orderly. We want people to feel like their time's being used wisely. There will be a, an opportunity to debate the issues. Eric Millsaps of the paper is going to moderate it. It will be an open meeting, open mic, and people will have an opportunity with time limits. And again, we hope everyone will follow the suggested rules of decorum that for and against will get every opportunity to speak for an extended period of time. That will be the final part of our commitment, the city's commitment, for the people to have a say. If you recall the first time we asked people's input on the date and the wording of the referendum. The second is this, e this evening, this meeting we're having tonight. The third will be the open meeting on the fourth. It will be at the Salt Block Auditorium. We hope to have a good turnout. It will follow our regular council meeting. Thank you all for being here, and thank all of you for your politeness. It will be at 530, 530.